What is up? My name is Dylan Hendrickson, and I'm here with Alex Tenorio. Um, we're the co-founders at Stacks, where we provide fractional CFO and full-service accounting services to business owners. Um, we're just going to have a quick conversation around some accounting and finances when it comes to your business. And I'm going to ask Alex, who's my business partner and a CPA, um, what he thinks about a couple of things. Let's do it. Let's do it. So let's just jump right in. So my first question I have is, what's the biggest mindset shift that a business owner needs to make when they're going from maybe being a non-business owner or having a very small business to now they have a growing, more large business, specifically when it comes to the accounting and finances? What's the mindset shift that they need to make? The mindset shift to me, uh, I think really is to start one, getting organized, really being purposeful about tracking the financial activity of the business. So, I mean, I think early on, there's more priority placed on just getting revenue through the door. Once you start growing and once you start hiring, um, you really do need to start taking these things seriously because the financial data is going to help guide you scale, make additional hires, um, look around corners for cash flow, look around corners with your financial data to see um, what you're actually profiting for your services, um, where you're overspending on cost. If you're keeping personal stuff and the business stuff separate, um, I think it, you know, it's just a level up in terms of, okay, this is actually a real business now and we need to treat it as such. And there's real world implications for the things that you're going to be doing. Um, whether that's taxes, whether it's even something, uh, legality wise. Um, but especially in terms of growth, you know, you can't, you're just, you're, you're trying to, you're flying blind if you're not honoring the numbers and knowing your numbers. If you don't know how profitable you are, um, you're just, you're flying blind and basically things can creep up on you if you're not staying on top of them. So I think definitely like organization is a big one. Um, and just being really purposeful about getting a really good understanding of your numbers because it will it will be a driving force for like your decision making as you start to make more higher level um, growth decisions, hiring, um, figuring out what your margins are on if you sell multiple services, what your costs are to fulfill each one of those, what your tax liability is going to be like. Um, all these things really matter. And, you know, if, if you're going to start stepping into a role of a, a CEO, um, it, it becomes really important. So. Absolutely. Yeah, to me, it's kind of like going from thinking about accounting and taxes and finances as just purely a compliance thing and a have to do and moving to a mindset of, okay, this data can actually be super useful to me. And it's actually one of the biggest um, unique advantages that we can have as a business if we have our numbers super dialed in, because now we're making decisions based on data and not just gut feeling all the time. Yeah, 100%. It's, it's required. I mean, that's, that's the reason why accounting is the lifeblood of business. Um, you know, it, it's, it's always going to be a central piece of a company. I mean, like if you're just starting out, you know, get revenue through the door, that's more of a priority. But once it starts, you know, once you start growing, it becomes a requirement. I mean, you just can't, it's just not even an option. You have, it's For a requirement. Sure to have your finances dialed. It's gonna be a legal nightmare, it's gonna be a tax nightmare, it's gonna be uh, a time and headache nightmare for you as an owner. Um, and you just can't scale effectively without knowing your numbers, so. For sure, yeah, and it's tough, like, because there is that side of it where it's like, yeah, you need the numbers to do the taxes, but it's also like, you're, you're likely leaving profit on the table if you don't have super dialed in, you know, profit margins, net profit margins, gross profit margins, et cetera. To where your business honestly probably could be more profitable than it is um, if you actually had access to the numbers. But the only way you can get access to the numbers is if you have your accounting super dialed in. Yeah. And also, I think um, the the mindset shift of just thinking, oh, yeah, it's accounting. I don't really know this, but like, it's fine. I'll just get my books cleaned up. Um, you know, th that's just the basic foundation. Um, having an accounting team, having a fractional CFO, having a CPA on your side, um, it, 
it's not just a baseline, hey, let's just take care of our books and okay, great. I'll pull my tax CPA out of the closet when taxes are due. Mm-hmm. But um, it's actually a flip where with that data, with some of these things that you can start building, whether it's like custom KPIs, margins based on fulfillment, you know, revenue or cost per team member, um, start start to see like the 80, 20 of your time and the cost of certain services. If you sell a few different things, all that translates into being able to actually make more money, um, not only just saving money. So, um, a lot of, a lot of people kind of think of it as just a, a baseline requirement when really it's, it's actually an offensive tool to make more money with that data. Absolutely. So yes, the shift from, Oh, it's just straight compliance. I have to do to, okay, I can leverage this to actually make more money and make my business more efficient and more profitable. 100%. Awesome. So the next question I have for you is, you know, talk a little bit about the importance of having one source of truth when it comes to a business owner's finances. Yeah. I mean, I would give the example of like, if you're running ads on Facebook, you're going to go to one place to see all the analytics and get an understanding of, you know, what my click through rate is on this ad, what my ROAS is on, on this ad, you know, which ads are performing better relative to the others. It's the same thing with, with your financials. Um, if you have multiple bank accounts, multiple cards, you're mixing personal stuff and business stuff. You're not tracking things in one central platform. Um, it just gets messy and it just makes it again. It's just like a complicating factor that is going to keep you from ultimately doing what you're going to have to be doing, which is tracking it all and leveraging that in those insights and the data to make those decisions. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it really comes down to like a required organizational input for you as a business owner. Absolutely. And then the other piece of that, that I think doesn't get talked about a lot is it will make it more difficult to, you know, delegate some of the financial aspects of the business down the line. If everything is spread across multiple Google Sheets, multiple accounting platforms, because then once you start to grow and you have multiple team members, maybe there's a chief of staff, maybe there's a COO, and you're trying to continually remove yourself so you can focus on higher leverage, higher leverage business activities. It makes it so difficult because you have there's so much nuance about where the finances are and there's no source of truth. So it's hard for those team members to do what you've probably hired them to do. You know, if they have to send invoices or pay commissions to salespeople, um, but those numbers are just in so many different platforms, it just really becomes a nightmare really, really quickly as you begin to grow and scale the business. So the more you can consolidate, you know, the financial processes into, you know, ideally one, but maybe it's one or two, one or three platforms, um, the better for sure, especially as you grow. Yeah, it's like everything. If you have an organized room, you know, you'll start the day off better if you have you know, your, your storage for like files, if that's organized in Google drive or whatever you're using, if you can always just kind of have a spot that's organized, okay, I'm going to this folder for this. I'm going to this folder for that. Um, you know, project management stuff. If you have your roles and responsibilities, due dates, parent level services listed and everybody knows where to go and the team can just bump right in and, and see exactly what they're doing on a day to day basis. The same goes for your, your financials. Um, so it, it bleeds into all aspects and, and the organization is just another thing. That's just, you got to do it. Absolutely. And when it comes to having one source of truth, what does that look like practically to you as far as maybe softwares that you like to use and leverage? I know it's going to be a little bit nuanced for each business, but just in general, how do we like to go about that? Um, it really starts with, you know, leveraging tech. Honestly, I think most, most businesses in America use QuickBooks, get the accounts connected to where you're not manually uploading your transactions, like get away from Google sheets. It can help be a crutch early in the early days, but once things start moving, you as an owner aren't going to, you're not going to want to be dealing with manually updating your Google sheets and kind of having a spotty here's kind of what I think I made. Uh, it's got to be comprehensive. So connecting your accounts, having, um, you know, a simplified chart of accounts, breaking out your, your revenue, uh, your types of revenue, breaking out your exact like costs for fulfillment, 
um, to where it's not just all lumping into sales and expenses. Um, being, you know, being practical about the amount of credit cards and, <clears throat> and business accounts that you have, you don't need to go unless there's like a, a, a tangible and significant benefit to opening a bunch of accounts and cards. It's just not necessary. Um, I agree. But making sure that's all connected in one place is is super important. Um, and again, it just goes back to like cleanliness and organization. Um, it the more things you have spread out where it's not getting tracked in one place, the di more difficult it's going to be for for you and your team members to, you know, basically analyze and make decisions based off of it. Yeah, and the accounting platforms have become so sophisticated at this point, you really can do 90% plus of what you need financial wise within these platforms. I mean, in QuickBooks, you can do everything you can invoice, yeah. you can pay bills, you can pay contractors, you can run payroll to where ideally you're keeping that all in there. And that's not saying that you as a business owner should be in there all the time. I mean, ideally, you have a team member or you have a fractional team that's handling that for you. But that way, if you have a fractional team handling it for you, they know the ins and outs of QuickBooks. Now all of your financial data is in one platform. It's in one spot, which is definitely a win. And and I totally agree with what you said about, you know, having an obnoxious amount of bank accounts and credit cards. Um, it just is so unnecessary for 99% of business owners out there. And it might be maybe slightly a hot take or unpopular opinion, but, you know, a lot of business owners read profit first. They open up a gazillion bank accounts because they're trying to put some in operating expenses, some in taxes, some in marketing and split it all up. But that is, in my opinion, just very unnecessary for most business owners because what really happens is most people don't stick with it. And now you're just have all of these bank accounts and it's just a mess. Yeah. A profit first is like, it's helpful if you're kind of a one man band <clears throat> and it's a very simple business. Sure. You know, I think you can get the same benefits, um, of just being mindful and, um, mindful about your cash flow and having like some purposeful planning around it to be able to like allocate enough funds to pay yourself. But with profit first, you kind of minimize a lot of the eventual requirements that you'll have to just have when you're growing um, and you have team members and you perhaps have multiple owners or there's tax implications that um, will cause you to operate differently. You know, cause if you're, if you're, it works in a simplified, you know, like isolated um, instance, but I think over time you'll find like, like, look, dude, Amazon is not doing profit first. Walmart's not doing profit first. Um, yeah. Larger companies are not doing that. You know, there, there's, you can get the same result by just like managing a forecast or um, just keeping enough cash in the bank and earmarking funds to be able to pay yourself um, and get to the same result. But yeah. Yeah. I think if you full blown all out commit to it and you're actually using the different bank accounts and doing it the right way, I can see where it could be useful. Just the problem is, is most people aren't disciplined enough to keep actually doing what they're supposed to be doing with it. I think maybe the one exception is like tools like Mercury have made that a little easier. Where yep. it's, it's pretty, it's pretty easy to make extra bank accounts in Mercury and set up automations to where if you go that route, sure, I could see it. But for most people, I just haven't seen it work out very great for the clients that we've onboarded that have tried to do that stuff. So next question explain the difference between a business that has financial reports that are, you know, just good enough for a tax return versus a business having financial reports that are actually useful for business decision making. Um, I would say so for, ta I mean, for taxes, like there's not, there's not one set of books across the board for any company that's ever going to be perfectly 100% accurate. That's just, that's just how the world works. Um, there's always little mini immaterial thing, especially larger companies. Like companies are still writing off minimal amounts that are immaterial just to get, you know, from point A to point B. Um, there's, you know, there's considerations with like the basis of whether you're going to go on a cash basis or an accrual basis that will, you know, typically you're going to show more net income on an accrual basis than you would on a cash basis that's going to have a consideration for how, you know, when you do your taxes, um, that like, that is more of a, 
attack strategy, like engineering side of things where we're positioning the financials to give you the best possible tax liability for your goals. Whether, I mean, there's some years where you might want to show more net income. Um, and then there's most, I would say, you know, it varies. Like the, there's some years you might want to show more net income than others. Um, and that's a tax consideration from, you know, like a growth consideration, you want to have granularity into all the costs, all your revenue, looking at your KPIs, crafting KPIs to be able to track your progress, um, leverage some of these ratios and, you know, efficiency numbers for, for you as a business owner to make those scaling decisions. And that is the, that's the tough balance that we have to make as CPAs and fractional CFOs is we got to balance crafting the books and tailoring it to the business specific to its industry, specific to the owner's goals. Um, but also balance that with how can we also position this to make sure that they're in the best tax position possible. Um, and it's tough, but it takes a lot of like daily and weekly effort to make sure that all the transactions that are occurring, not only are getting placed in the right buckets, but are being tracked in a way that's actionable um, for the owner to make those scaling decisions. For sure. You know, and because on the tax side, you know, the IRS doesn't really care what it looks like. They care about how much did you make? How much did you spend? How much did you net and pay tax on that amount? Right. So it really comes as like a chart of accounts type of thing, really, when you like really whittle it down. Right. Because when you're listing your expenses on your tax return, if you just put advertising and lump all your advertising costs in there, like IRS, like, that's great. Sure. You spent $100,000 advertising. Great. Now, from a business perspective, that might not be a super insightful way to present that data, right? Maybe you spent $25,000 across four different platforms. And as a business owner, it's important for you to see how much ad spend you're running across these different platforms and the ROI that's coming to that. So that's kind of one example of like, okay, sure, lump it, lump it all into advertising, lump all of your sales revenue into one revenue account. For a tax return for the IRS, sure, that's great. But for business decision making, you know, if you have three different um, revenue buckets that you generate cash from, you know, you probably want to see the three different ones so you can see how much you're making from each one and see what your profitability is for each one and things like that. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and I mean, even more down the road, like there's, there's considerations if you want to even be able to grow. Like if you just don't have a good handle on things, I'll give you an example. Um, like you literally can't do things like maintaining a line of credit, depending on the relationship with, with any given bank. Like uh, one of our clients, they had multiple lines of credit across different banks. Each bank will kind of have their own requirements to say, hey, if you want to have this million dollar line of credit and draw down on it, we're going to cap you on a percentage of your receivables. Okay. They're going to ask for that data every quarter. And then you've got to go and make sure that you're giving them accurate data. Um, not only is it a requirement, but like if you're just, if it's messy and you're submitting data to the bank, um, it can cause a problem down the road if, the, if those numbers aren't accurate. They might just cancel your line of credit. There might even be legal issues around that. I don't know. But, um, you know, th those things are important if you got to maintain certain requirements for some loans that you have, um, or investors, like if you're going to try to position the company for an exit that starts well before, Hey, I'm ready to, you know, sell the company. Like you, there's a roadmap to position the financials to get there. Um, if you have your, if your books aren't accurate and it's not positioned in a way that, um, is enticing for an investor, um, they're going to tear your books to shreds and, all that Absolutely. kind of just goes back to you just it's just you have to at a larger scale it's there's many more complexities than just you know running your transactions through quickbooks if you're you know an agency owner um and you're doing fifty hundred thousand dollars a month like that's that's great there's still a lot of important things that need to be done there but um once you become a larger business and there's more complexities involved more relationships more um, debt considerations, more tax considerations, more 
entity considerations, investor considerations, things get complicated really quick. Absolutely. Yeah. And I kind of, I don't have this one written down, but it kind of, one of your answers kind of makes you want to go down that path a little bit where you're talking about investor considerations, exit considerations, because, you know, at Stacks, obviously I take the sales calls and I do get a lot of people on there that are like, yeah, you know, we're, we're starting to hear rumblings of like investors are starting to get interested and like, we think there could be a potential exit within the next few years. And we just want to make sure, you know, our books are ready for that so that it's not this big mess that they have to clean up. Right. Because that would suck. Like you're going to an exit or, you know, private equity reaches out and wants to give you a ton of money for a piece of your business, but your books are in shambles. Now it's like, okay, we have to hurry and try to get these books in a decent spot to give to these investors. Because if somebody is, you know, thinking about investing your company or purchasing your company, like the first place they're going to go to is income statement balance sheet. And that's the number one spot where they're going to nickel and dime you on your purchase price. Like having your books not in order and you're going into maybe trying to have an exit in the next few years could literally cost you an immense amount of money on, you know, the enterprise value of you exiting that business. Yeah. I mean, like you can literally have a deal get revoked and end up in a lawsuit um, if you, if things weren't disclosed properly in your balance sheet. If somebody ends up buying your company, if you have a 6X multiple and your enterprise value is $10 million and somebody comes and buys it for $10 million and, you know, they start, you know, after their due diligence, um, things get transferred over, right? Two months down the road, they find out that there wasn't this massive liability that was reported on the balance sheet. Um, there could literally be clawback considerations in the contracts, you could end up in a big dispute legal issue where that might cost you not only, um, you know, the funds that were paid to you, if you sold it to an investor, um, there's a lot of issues that that can come up. I mean, especially just um, getting the best multiple for your company. If investors are going to want to see if let's say you're um, an agency that has programs, coaching programs, and they have a recurring um, software that you sell. Um, all that kind of goes to the multiple because if you have, you know, recurring revenue coming in from um, the SaaS side, if that's not broken out with from the coaching program as well, um, you're not going to be able to command a higher multiple because it's just not. It's not you can't understand um, how much they're making on one-time purchases versus recurring purchases and investors are going to want to see that. So if you can't break out the two, you're going to be in trouble. Investors are not going to be interested. It might affect your multiple. Um, if, if the investor potential buyers, you know, comes in, they see your books and they're just not understanding or things aren't where they should be um, during, doing due diligence, uh, adding more resources and time, to the process, like time kills all deals. If, if you have holes in your, in your books, um, you might lose the deal and people might walk away. Um, so For it sure. scare, scare off investors, scare off, um, people looking to buy your business. So it's really important. For sure. And you kind of touched on what I was going to say next is, you know, they're going to want to see the financials, but you know, they're also going to want to know things like, okay, like what's the lifetime gross profit of some of your customers? Like what's your average LTV? What's your churn rate? What is the gross profit margin across the three or four different services that you provide? They're going to want to know those things. And the only way that you can derive, you know, the results for KPIs like that is having the bookkeeping and the accounting be super, super dialed in. So it kind of, you know, it flows, you know, the bookkeeping is just the very basic, you know, categorizing transactions, but being able to get these KPIs and get these metrics to help make your business more profitable, but also position yourself, you know, for an exit, if that's your goal is all super important. So moving yep. to next question. So we've talked a little bit about financial KPIs and how, you know, your accounting data can help le help you leverage some of these financial KPIs. So what are some of those core financial KPIs that business owners should be tracking every month and should be trying to improve upon? Um, I mean, it really varies, but I think, you know, gr gross profit margin is a big one. 
um, you know, your, your, your margins broken down by your, your service revenue components, um, uh, tracking your cash flow is a big one. Um, you know, KPIs around, uh, receivables, payables, you know, how quickly can you get cash in the door? Uh, from customers, how, how, how much can you extend out how much you pay to your vendors and how long, um, you know, average day, you know, payable day is outstanding. Um, the longer you can put off paying vendors and the shorter you can, the shorter amount of days that you have where, where customers are paying you, that all is going to affect your cash flow. Um, lifetime value, MRR, churn, runway. Um, you know, all these things are definitely really important to track for sure. I think obviously just the baseline tracking your revenue growth, tracking your profit growth, uh, over time, all these things are, are really important. I agree. Yeah. And the very first one you said is the one that's most important in, in my opinion. And that's that, that gross profit margin, gross profit margin is so huge because it affects so many different parts of the business and it's applicable to pretty much every business. You know, almost every business out there, every business out there, there's some sort of cost on the product or the service that you're delivering. So seeing how much profit you have after it, what it costs you to deliver the service, super, super important because it's one of the most important metrics that if, because if you improve it, you directly improve your, your net profit margin and your net income. If you can improve your gross profit margin. Yeah. And I'll give you an example. Like. If you know, if, let's say you have five different tiers of revenue or subsets of customers. If you know that um, each one of these tiers, the average day until they churn is X amount of days, you know, one, you'll be able to see where the outliers are. If revenue for this service or customers for this service churn on an average of 120 days. Um, and, mo and all others are turning at 60 or 70. It's like, okay, well, let's maybe dive into this more and figure out why that is. Also, if you know these, these percentages, you can literally have, uh, you can take action around it. And this kind of goes back to being able to not only, you know, utilize a fractional CFO as just a requirement for taking care of the books, but actually, if you know these percentages, you can stay on the offensive and actually utilize this data to make more money um, and increase the quality of your fulfillment. So like, if you know that uh, these buckets of clients are churning with the next amount of days, you can then have, uh, you can set some actions. Um, you can have your team basically take, take action and be like, okay, two weeks before this average churn date, three weeks before this average turn date, we're going to reach out. We're going to, we're going to set some time to jump on a call with them and go through things or, or, you know, add additional value up, up to that date to make sure that the over time that number comes down. Absolutely. Um, and knowing those numbers are going to be really, really crucial for you. And again, it's just, it's not just, Hey, we're here to do your books. We're here to save you money. We're actually going to empower you and arm you with, the data that you need to inc increase your revenue, improve your performance, um, inc increase your satisfaction from your clients. Um, it's yeah, it's, it's crucial. And, and a small change can, um, at scale create a ton of profit, um, comparatively. Yeah. I think that's honestly one of the biggest silent killers of people's businesses and people's profits is, you know, they'll have, you know, these three different service lines, and, or even just two, say you have two main services that you deliver and one will have a gross profit margin of 80% and one will have a gross profit margin of maybe 50 or 40%, but they sell 10 times more the item that has a 40% gross profit margin and the other one that has an 80% gross profit margin, they just kind of sell occasionally or they don't really push that one as hard where it's like, dude, scrap this one, go in on this one and your profit will skyrocket, right? But like we've mentioned a few times, you never get that data if the accounting just isn't super dialed in. The other piece too, just quickly, you know, I know Alex, you have a bunch of experience with ads, but this is where if you know your lifetime gross profit of a customer, it actually allows you to run paid ads more profitably because, you know, 
for example, you could spend, you know, $400 on ad spend, you get a client that pays you $500 in your mind, you might think, Oh, hell yeah, like, we put $400 in someone paid us $500. But that's not considering the cost for you to deliver on that $500 service to where if that's $500 service, it costs you $200 to fulfill on. Okay, well, now you put $400 in and effectively got $300 back. And that's not a very profitable way to run ads. Yeah. And even the flip side, um, you might, you know, think it's not beneficial. You know, you might, you might see um, an ad campaign going and, and your cost per call that you that generates from those ads is $200 um, and see another ad set that's giving a cost per call at $500. You might actually realize, you know, there's been instances where it's much more advantageous to scale the $500 cost per call because it it permeates through your sales teams. It creates additional because the $500 cost per call, maybe there's more friction added to the flow um, and you're spending more dollars cost, you know, for each call. But the people that are on those calls are much more high intent, much more likely to purchase, much more. They're, they're more nurtured and they're larger businesses. Maybe they stay twice as long. Money, right. That are able to, that, you know, are kind of the ideal ICP for your service. You might want to you, you might realize that that five hundred dollar cost per call ad set is actually more beneficial for you to scale up versus the two hundred dollar one that might give you um it might just flood your sales team's calendars with a lot more unqualified people and drain resources and time and overall that might lead to more churn if you're starting to accept more clients that are un unqualified um it's going to over time probably start eating away at your margins um so yeah all these things have these you know, side effects, um, that if you're not actually analyzing the data, um, you know, you could start going in the wrong direction. Yeah. So, so one last nugget on the gross profit margin thing. Um, we've talked about it a lot in these 30 minutes so far, super, super important metric for your business. And honestly, when we onboard new clients at stacks, it's one of the things we see that's the biggest issue is most of the people we onboard don't have this broken out literally one ounce. Um, so your cost of your cost of services, your cost of goods, that's whatever it costs for you to directly deliver your product or service on your income statement. Those items should go above your gross profit. And if basically the way to know if you have this broken out or not is if your gross profit is the same number as your total revenue, then you don't have it broken out and you need to find a better accountant. Basically, um, that can kind of be one of the markers for you. So a lot, oftentimes all of the business's expenses get put underneath the gross profit. You know, I like to use a video editing agency as an example, right? You're delivering edited videos. Your cost of services might be paying the editor, paying the thumbnail designer and paying for software. Those expenses should essentially be above the gross profit line. Um, so just yeah. something to take away if you're watching this. Um, yeah. And, and it also, you know, just to build off that, like, you you will eventually want to streamline your efficiencies of your team, right? Like you're going to want to be able to see um, what impact your team members that are tied into those direct fulfillment costs are producing and the value of that. Um, you might find that, uh, you know, one, I mean, we had this, we had this come up with one of our, one of our clients, he, you know, basically was uh, assuming that this one client that he was providing services for was just not very valuable to him, like not profitable, um, you know, and and uh, he was feeling like he was spending too much time on it relative because he was thinking that this client wasn't actually very profitable. And we basically um, come to find out that it was much more of a profitable engagement than he initially thought because we, we got in and we dialed the numbers in um, and basically showed him like, here's the actual inputs of costs that you had for this client. Um, you were actually making X amount of dollars per month off this client when you thought you were making half of that. And he was going to basically churn this client um, because of that. And he basically had a 
realization that, oh, okay, like, yeah, this is actually much better than I thought it was. And they kept going. So, um, yeah, it's important to break, break everything out and those time efficiencies for your team, um, you know, what revenue you're generating for each one of your team members, what the costs of, um, you know, hiring these team members, those are all going to be predicted values for you to be able to make hiring decisions as you continue to scale. Cause you'll have a benchmark of how much this employee costs, what department they're in. Um, all these things matter when you're trying to make decisions. Absolutely. Yeah. We, we mentioned, you know, if you can improve your gross profit, it directly increases your net profit. Um, so the ways you can do that is obviously make your cost of services less, but if, or you can raise your prices too, but the piece, the piece that you want to be careful is like, obviously you don't want your service delivery to go down. So that might not mean you fire all of your people that deliver your services, right? Like that's not the goal necessarily, but what it does mean is maybe, maybe it comes to, okay, how can I get these three team members to be able to fulfill for more clients at a time at the same quality, effectively increasing that gross profit. And, you know, that kind of leads into the next question, which is what financial KPIs could a business owner use to help make better decisions around when to hire their next team member? Because, you know, you hear that all the time, like, oh my gosh, don't hire too late. Like you're better to hire way early than to hire super late. And there's a bunch of you know, conflicting opinions around all of that. So how can a business owner leverage their finances, maybe a financial KPI to help them hire at the right time? And what KPI um, would that be? I think, you know, first of all, you want to be able to know, is it just generally even a good idea to start putting more resources behind this aspect of your business? If you don't know um, what you're actually making, relative to your other income streams, um, you won't know if it makes sense just even at first glance to start hiring more for that. Um, so getting a good understanding of like, how profitable is this segment of my business? Should I even be putting more money behind it? Is it worth it? Am I doing the 80, 20 of it? Maybe, um, maybe I'm actually way more profitable, um, in this area and I'm spending less time doing it. Whereas I might be spending twice the amount of time for less profit doing, you know, service B. Um, so I think getting a good understanding of, of that is kind of like the baseline first, but also, okay, well, if we add on another, uh, say we bring somebody in house and we're paying them six, $7,000 a month. Okay. Is that going to allow us to facilitate demand for another 10 to 20 clients that are going to come in? And whereas otherwise, not only will we not be able to facilitate that, but we're going to start stifling our operations for the existing clients that we have. Um, you know, you want to make sure that you're hiring in the, in the way that uh, not only is it anticipating your demand, but it's also like predictable. Like, can we actually fulfill another 20 clients with this hire? What's the revenue if we, if we brought on another 10 to 20 clients and will this one person be able to facilitate that? Um, then you have a pretty clear example of, okay, if I'm charging 5K a month, we can bring in 10 more clients, that's 50 grand. If I'm paying somebody seven to $10,000 a month, okay, great. I have you know basically a 5X return on that one additional hire. And not only that, but um, the, the current team that's facilitating other existing clients are still able to do their job efficiently and not get bogged down um, if they're trying to handle more clients just to save some money. So. You know, it's like a flip on realizing that at a certain point, like you just, if you're a single man, you know, one man band, like trying to scale things up at a certain point, you're going to scale out of your own ability to facilitate at a high level and at a, for sure you know, with high quality. So it, it pays to spend more and, and uh, invest in your team, um, bring on new people and just, you know, have a multiplication factor on, on your growth. For sure. And some of the, you know, financial KPIs that you could use to help the timing of when to hire some of them. So what comes to mind is, okay, what's my average revenue per team member right now? And if you know, okay, maybe at a certain, maybe at a certain stage of your business, there's 30 clients, there's five team members, and you have a very, everything's very efficient right now. And you can see your average revenue per team member is X amount of dollars. 
you probably can see, okay, once this number hits a certain point, we're probably getting to the point where there's so many clients that our team members are probably starting to hit that breaking point. And now it's, okay, let's hire the next team member, get that KPI back to where, you know, it should be where the team is running very efficiently, not with, you know, time to spare necessarily. You want your team to be, you know, borderline, you know, high pressure a little bit. Um, but just seeing the average revenue per employee, average profit per employee, um, average revenue, average profit per client even can help with those metrics as well. Um, I know we have one client who, when they first started working with us, you know, they were like negative 10, 20, $30,000 a month in profit. And we were able to kind of break out, okay, what is the average revenue per, per client, average revenue per team member? And we were actually able to help because they were over hiring. They were hiring yeah. quicker than they needed to, to where being able to see the profitability per engagement and the profitability per team member um, allowed them to hire more efficiently. And now last month, I think they had had a hundred thousand dollar month. So yeah, pretty cool. and it's a good benchmark to have when you're making decisions because there's the financial component of it, but there's also the, you know, the culture component as well. Like if you're, you know, leaders of companies, you're going to want to also make sure, am I, you know, Am I crafting my team in a way where I'm not just trying to extract every single dollar and let's just screw the, you know, the morale of everybody else and let's just try to get, get them to work on as many clients as possible. Um, knowing your numbers based on that will also help when you're making these decisions, thinking about your team members, um, you know, just well-being as well. Like you want to make sure that, um, you're making sure that they're comfortable, they're not hit, hitting capacity. Um, being able to get around and look around corners will allow you to see from a financial standpoint, okay, like when am I hitting capacity with margins on this service or my team fulfilling on, on uh, this set of clients? Um, that will make it easier for you to be able to say, okay, um, this is typically when we're hitting capacity here. Let's check in on our team and make sure that, you know, it doesn't make sense now to just bring somebody else on because otherwise their productivity is going to, going to spike. Um, and you know, it comes back to culture. If you want to be, um, you know, if you want to be scaling and, and retaining top talent, you can't just dump 30 clients on one person and just think they're going to be the fix for everything. So. For sure, man. Well, cool. This was fun. You got anything else? Any final thoughts or questions before we wrap it up? No, no, I think this was cool. Yeah, this was awesome. We'll keep doing this. If you liked this style of video, definitely let us know and we'll see you on the next one.